Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. We have on a fantastic guest. He has worked with some major artists, and we're going to be talking about something that I think is going to be an unusual topic of conversation for us. You're really going to want to tune into this one, whether you're a producer, engineer, or artist, because it is all about artist development with one Mr. Mark Needham. Mark Needham has been nominated for Grammys, I think something like 11 times. It's been a lot. Uh, some of his <laughs> big successes in artists that he's developed, The Killers is always one that comes up. Uh, they had a multi-platinum selling record with Hot Fuss that he produced. But he's worked with a tremendous number of artists. One I've got to shout out because it was like one of the first records that I heard that made me go like, wow, production is big was Chris Isaac's Wicked Game. If you've never heard that track, just like pause this and go listen to that. Because that was one of the first things I heard where I'm like, wow, how much like the right vibe, the right ambience can add to a song. That was a huge, huge hit and a really cool track too. Uh, he's worked with Imagine Dragons, Pink, Neon Trees, Shakira, Pete Yorn, Block Party, so many bands, uh, Fleetwood Mac, The Killers we mentioned before, just a tremendous number of artists, and I'm really excited to have him on. Mark, thanks for joining us on the podcast. It's good to be here. All right, excellent, man. I'm really excited about our topic today. Uh, before we get into this whole thing of artist development, of taking artists from a seed of something interesting to a act that you could sign to a label and get kind of residuals off of for years to come. Or if you're an artist, scouting out, working with the right producer who's going to take you from where you are to a totally another level. This conversation with Mark, I think, is going to be really eye-opening, no matter what part of the industry you're in or interested in. Before we get there, I do have to give the big shout out, your 90 seconds or so of pure bliss, as I shout out this week's sponsors. Leading off with Sonarworks. Sonarworks, they make correction systems for headphones, speakers, rooms. Basically, you sit down in your room, you put up a microphone, and it will capture the idiosyncrasies of your room and then correct for them so that you can trust what you're hearing in both your speakers and your room much more than ever before. It also does the same stuff for headphones, making headphones way flatter than they've ever been. Uh, in addition to Sonarwork sponsoring, we also have Sound Toys sponsoring. Once again, Sound Toys, thank you guys. These guys make some of my favorite creative effects plugins out there. You can try out anything they make for free at soundtoys.com. Last but not least, another podcast. I don't think Mark's ever been on the Gear Club podcast, but once you're done here, maybe one day you'll go visit those guys. They do a ton of great interviews. Check them out at gear-club.net. That's gear-club.net. Or type in Gear Club into wherever you're getting this podcast. All right. With that big shout out out of the way, big warm welcome, Mr. Mark Needham. Thank you so much for joining me. How are things in sunny LA today? It's good. It's good. All right. Now that is a pretty desk you've got behind you and some nice speakers. Are those <laughs> ATCs or what are those behind you there? Those are the ATC 45s with the ATC sub. Nice. How long have you been working on those? About three and a half years, I guess. I had ACC 25s prior to that, but um, I have two set. I have two sets of these. A set here and a set in Nashville, and I I really I really love these speakers. They're just they, you know, it's the detail. My mixes sound better working on them. So I, that you know, nice man. And then that that desk behind you is that uh, that's some type of multi touch uh, control surface. What's that? That's a that, that's the Slate uh, Ravens, and Stephen built the very first dual one for me. Gosh, five years ago or something. It was one of the first ones that he built, and I, I just I, lo I love the I, the ergonomics of working on these. It's been I, I think that my workflow seems faster. I don't have monitors between my speakers, which is which I, I appreciate. And also, I have like a really nice view here. So yeah. That's right. I don't want big speakers. I paid a lot for this view, you know. <laughs> I actually want to be able to see out the window. Yeah. Um, Nice. Good stuff, man. All right. Well, it looks beautiful in there. I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of artist development. For those who don't know what it means, you've done this multiple times, taking uh, an artist that they weren't known yet and developing them into something that could sell a lot of records, make a lot of people happy, and uh, really get some good reach. And one of the, the bands you did that with was The Killers. So just if you can give us just like an overview of 
what that looks like. First of all, how did you get into this idea of artist development? And then I want to ask you more specifically about The Killers as just a, an example of it. So when did you first get the sense, this is what I should be doing, this is something that's going to make sense for me in my career, this artist development? Well, I mean, it's it's something that I that I started early in my career, probably in the mid-70s, late 70s, just... You know, if, if somebody wasn't walking in the door with cash to, to, to be working, I wanted, to, you know, I wanted to be working every day, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And, you know, if there wasn't somebody pounding down the door with money, I would be out dragging bands in and, <laughs> and recording. I mean, that's, this is what I love to do, paid or not, you know. And I started figuring out ways to, to help, you know, help bands out, maybe get paid for it if things blew up. And um, I, I started early on also trying to use it as a vehicle to help steer my career because like I did a lot of ja- a lot lot of uh, jazz production for a while and um, I would go to look at my credits and people would think oh well, you're a jazz producer it's like not really I should have a rock, you know I've been a rock guy since I was a kid um, I was a rock guitar player and drummer and you get a hit like with wicked game and p- p- people know you for that sound and that's all they want to come to you with and like I listen to a lot more styles of music, so I figured that was an easier way to help steer my career rather than sitting around waiting for a label or a band to come to me with something that you know that's more of a departure from whatever my last single big single was. Right, and that's brilliant. So it keeps you from getting pigeonholed, you know, or if you want to Absolutely. find a new pigeonhole, you can create that pigeonhole for yourself. Man, this decade or this next few years, I want to work on records like this. You know, what can I do to create a portfolio for myself so that people are coming to me for that, so that I'm known for that? And I think it's a great right. thing a lot of people could learn from. Just uh, real quick on the economic side of things, I've known a lot of people who have built up studios and every time they have a little bit of extra you know, cash sitting around, they want to go reinvest it into more gear. And, and that can be great, <laughs> sure. And, you know, yeah. gear can maybe every once in a while someone will book you because you have a piece. But my goodness, if you took some of that resources in time or in funding or float or whatever it is and invest some of that into people and projects, I mean, you're building a portfolio and that's going to be a better calling card than any piece of gear, I feel like. I mean, I, I I mean I was a gear whore. I not, not as much as I, I I you know not as much now as I used to be. But so you can do both. I, you're telling me you could do both. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, Mr. Brightside was you know it was recorded and mixed on a eight input Neve console, but you know one of the little sidecars right. with almost no plugins. It was it was uh, I did a rough mix on it, and that's what ended up on the record. I spent probably. I don't know, 35, 40 minutes re-editing the song and and coming up with a mix, and that's what ended up on the record. And there wasn't a lot of anything really fancy going on. The vocals were on a SM58, but you know, it's, it's spending the time to get a great song and come up with try to come up with a sound that's unique to a bit to a particular band that everybody wants to be for the next five years. Yeah. As, to me, is more important than, than having a big collection of gear that, you know, you're just doing the same sound over and over. Totally. So what was, would you say were some of your first big successes in this artist development angle? What were some of the first ones that really kind of got either A, brought you clients or B, that really made a name for themselves out there uh, once you worked with them? Well, I mean, we, we started with Chris right before he, before his was signed to Warner's. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a partner, Eric Jacobson, I worked with for years on projects. But Wicked Game was on actually on the third album signed to Warner Brothers. That was Chris's third album. I mean, I guess the one that really, I first, the first one that really went crazy was the the Killers on that Hot Fuss record. I had um, two partners that we decided to get together and develop three bands and see if we can get them signed. We got all, we you know, we developed three, we got all of them signed. The the killers happened to do by far the best of any of those, you know. Right. 
that seems to be how it works in in record making in general in the major label paradigm i think it's often numbers tossed out about there as you you know you put out 10 records and you hope one makes it and help support the other nine that that didn't blow up as big but when you're going to be in there day in day out you got to be a little more selective than that so one out of three as meatloaf might say ain't bad at all especially if they blow up as big as the killers what were the other two uh, from that same period the other one was a, uh, was a guy named Joe. We had, he got signed to three labels in the period of a year, a year and a wow. half, I think we got. And there was another one called The Lovemakers that we signed to Interscope. Mm. Both were good bands, but, you know, sometimes they're just, the stars are aligned. And, you know, I, I mean, actually, I think The the Lovemakers got signed first. The Killers was, was, a hard, was a hard one to get signed. I mean, no, no one really wanted to sign that record. Interesting. Um, now, why is that? What was some of the pushback you got uh, on that record that ended up be- becoming so big? You know, it was uh, it was hard for people to put into a category, so it's hard for them to see where this is going to fit on the radio. So, I mean, that was that album we shopped to all the majors in the U.S. No one was really ready to bite on it. I, I mean, everybody passed on it. Basically, our our only option left was a small indie in the U.K., Lizard King. Mm. And Zane Lowe, you know, heard it at Radio One and picked "Love the Song." I just actually saw, saw Zane about uh, last week, and we were talking about it. like, "Oh my God, this song just went so crazy!" I mean, it's you know, it's been on the charts longer than any other song in the UK. It's uh, it's the it's the longest running chart, wow. uh, the long, longest running song on the on the UK charts in history. So mm-hmm. it's. You know, it, 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 it's great to get one of those. Not all of them could be that, but I, you know, I try to mitigate my risk by really picking out stuff that I believe in and that's, that I feel has a lot of believability and, and just mitigate the risk on doing those. Now, how do you mitigate the risk on them? Is it just the fact that you believe in them or are there other factors that are going into it to say, I feel confident going all the way through this because I, I know the worst that could happen is X, Y, Z. What do you mean by that, mitigating the risk? Well, I, I mean, for me, I try to find stuff that an artist, is, especially, you know, with great lyrics, a vocalist that is, that is totally believable. Mm. Um, I think that's something that audiences suss out so quickly that, that someone isn't, they don't really, you know, live those lyrics that they're singing. Mm. So, I, you know, I try to look for that. I p- p- people who are willing, people who have an identity, but an identity that, you know, that needs to be formed, uh, you know, it needs to be shaped a little more. So, you know, just if you can find a band you can work with, that I, I can listen to them and see, you know, this is what it should sound like. And they're willing to kind of work and, and you know, and and w- to work with you and and want to, to, to help see that vision, you know. But mm-hmm. I don't want to he- hear a band and then try to fit them into my image. I want to I want to be able to I want to be able to see that vision when I hear them and go, God, if you guys were to say if we just try a little of this or that, you know, we can come up with something unique. And I mean, to me, it's always best, again, to be the band that everybody wants to be for the next five years rather than. Oh, can we mix it like, you know, can we be a little of this and that, you know, different bands that are on the radio, chasing what's on the radio. It's never that attractive to me. Right. No, I think it's a great point. I mean, it can make it harder to sell the band in the beginning, like uh, you experienced with the Killers, but bands that really break through and become a touchstone for others are the ones that are a bit of a departure, you know? They are just in tune enough with a, with what's going on so that they're they're current and they're in tune with you know the zeitgeist and all that. But there has to be some something that separates them from everything that came before for people to really get excited. Well, uh, you know, if I'm using it as you know using that as a vehicle to maybe to have a bunch more work for the next five years because you're trying to create a lane, you know, if you're helping to start that new lane, it, obviously that then you know if I'm just picking up on something that's something that twenty other people are already doing, that's really not going to that's really not going to help my career much over the next five or 10 years. And once there's 20 other people already doing it, you're probably near the end of that. That's <laughs> the correct. Yeah, that, near the beginning. yeah that, that, that's, that cycle's ending. And yeah. it might, you know, it might take two or three years or something to get one of these developed. So, 
just following what other people are doing is it's not that good of an idea yeah it's funny i remember in like the the early 2000s or something you see it in like uh major motion pictures too i remember there was like a period in the early 2000s there's like three or four movies about like meteors in a row like an asteroid's gonna hit earth and there's like five <laughs> of them in a row and we come to like the fifth one and now it's like a made for tv movie or whatever it's like come on guys we've done this yeah. like you yeah. want to be the first guy with a meteor movie <laughs> all right um moving on a little bit uh uh, so, uh, Mr. Brightside was probably the biggest track off of uh, that killer's record, uh, Hot Fuss. And you said you mixed this thing on a little Neve sidecar, like a, a, a small, you know, multi-input desk. We're not, we're not talking about a big one. What was the studio environment there where you guys were working together? We t- did those first songs at uh, my my partner, Jeff Salzman. We built a studio in his house up in Oakland, in the, in the kind of in the basement so it's just a small, super live room. Um, you know, we had some neat preamps in there, and you know, I mean, it wasn't really, really a, a proper working studio at the time. It wasn't like a commercial studio. It was just something we'd built in Jeff's house to be able to work on some of these bands. At that point, I was also I was living in L.A. I'd lived in the Bay Area for a long time, but I just I would drive up and. You know, we'd start working on this. We finished up some of the hot fuss stuff at my st- studio that I was working at in LA as well. But that, I think Mr. Brightside was probably, I think that was the first song that we did. Um, so it was recorded in, you know, four or five hours. It wasn't that much time spent on it. And I had some problems with the arrangement and tried some different arrangement ideas, which everybody loved. We made a mix and that was it. Wow. All right, that song's done, you know? Wow, so that was all same day, these arrangement suggestions you're making. It's not like a uh, a multiple day process where you're hearing pre-production demos, powwowing them with them, you know, in the rehearsal room about the arrangement. It just happens there in the studio? Uh, well, that was the case on that song. I mean, every song's different. I try, uh, I mean, generally, I try to have a lot more pre-production, you know, in ahead of time. But that, that, for that song, I was just coming up from L.A., They'd started tracking the song, and I was came in and went, well, we could try this, this, and this. But, you know, if I'm working on a project, I like to really go in with kind of a plan ahead of time. Usually, but it's kind of like war or something. You, you know, you go in with a plan, and things start, and it's like, oh, my God, it's all going off some other direction. But I, I, always, I always feel better if I come in with a plan. Yeah. It does, you know, you don't always end up following it. Right, right. But it's uh, it's good to get some of the thinking done in advance instead of having to do it all on the spot. I think it was Mike Tyson who said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And sometimes <laughs> making a record feels right. a little bit like that. Right. Yeah. right. So uh, how did you uh, discover these three artists you, you signed uh, at that time? Where Were you looking for them at shows? Are you getting demo tapes? What is the most fertile ground for you for finding those right artists that you can then pick out and say, Let, let's work together more closely i mean on uh, the killer to i mean there was the three of us me uh jeff saltzman Braden merrick Braden was out was online early you know looking for bands and you know we would go out and you know we'd find a whole bunch of bands for, could go to clubs see them play and decide well this is yeah we love this one let's try it the killers we went to see it a little club in Las Vegas was across from the, it was in a strip mall across from the Hard Rock Hotel. It was a real dive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was one of the ones we picked up. I, you know, I have networks of people that I've worked with over the years around the U.S. and around the world that send me stuff. I get a lot of stuff through my website. Imagine Dragons. There was involvement with the Killers through that, through the, the Reynolds family, Robert Reynolds, was originally the lawyer and then the manager for the killers. Mm-hmm. His young youngest brother, or second to youngest brother, there's a whole bunch of them, is Dan Reynolds mm-hmm. from Imagine Dragons, the singer from Imagine Dragons. Mac Reynolds manages Dan, so they called me up and asked me to come, you know, to come see Dan's band. We went to, they were playing it down on Fremont Street, I think, and Again, it was just the first time I saw Dan. I, you know, the songs were not quite, were certainly not there yet from to where Night Visions ended up being. But just the first time I, li- I mean, real, literally the first five minutes I listened to Dan, it's like, 
he just oozes believability. You know, mm. I mean, this guy wears, he, he just wears his heart on his sleeve. And those, yeah. the heart is, you know, his heart is those songs. So that was a super easy decision for me to, yes, I want to be involved in this, you know. And all these deals obviously look different from band to band. But, uh, you know, I just, I, when I can find those things and, and I, you know, I just really want to be part of them and help it. It's so it's it's such a fun time also mm-hmm. in a band's career. You know, when you're starting to play clubs and a year later you see them come back around and there's eighteen or twenty five thousand people screaming these songs. You mm-hmm. know, it can happen so quickly sometimes. It's amazing. You know, it's a yeah. it's just a, it's an exciting exciting time to be part of a band's career. Oh, absolutely. And they must really trust you at, at that point. I mean, there must be a lot of trust going on between you and them. Do you ever have any obstacles to uh, es- establishing that trust? Are there things you do to try to establish that trust? Or is it like at this point, they kind of know who you are and they're like, ah, he's done good stuff with other people. He'll be cool with us too. Or Well, I mean, I always, I mean, you always have to respect what the band's trying to, trying to accomplish as well. I, I you know, I, I certainly have disagreements with the bands I, I, I you know, approaches to stuff. Ever, but, but I'm always a fan of actually just trying it. You know, you got two different opinions. Let's try this one. Let's try that one. You know, we can listen back. This one's better. You know, it's obvious. Huh? But I mean, usually I see those when those turn into problem. It's usually because it's devolved into this two-hour conversation about mm. something that would take five minutes to record, people arguing about it for three hours without <laughs> right. actually just, without, well, just try A and try B. Damn, A's way better. Let's listen to that. Let's listen to A and B tomorrow. You know, it'll yeah. be clear. Um, you know, usually those things are not that hard if people don't get so emotionally attached right. to, their, to their opinion and just without actually just recording the two and listening to them. Yeah, so you're going to have disagreements as long as you can avoid getting bogged down in them and avoid them becoming sticking points. If you find a way through them, then I imagine uh, it's much less rocky. Well, yeah, when, when th- things become contentious over issues like that, over, I don't think that chorus works. Okay, well, it's, you know, sometimes it's better to just try, right, let's try this way, this way, try these two different things. And let's work on to another song. Let's come back tomorrow and, and listen with fresh ears. I gotcha. And uh, so Imagine Dragons is another one that you developed. You took them from the early stage, finding someone who seemed believable, authentic to you, and let's flesh things out and put some more refinement into this. What was, what's the process like as far as length of time? Where do you start when you find a new artist? Are you starting by listening to pre-production demos? And, and what's the, the time span like? That was one that, that Matt came to me with. It was, they had already been in the process of doing some recording. Um, so they had some stuff that, that, that they had been working with already. And I was, my involvement on that one was getting in more as a mixer than a producer. But uh, I work as a producer mixer. I have ideas here. We could change this. We could come in with more of this kind of sound. And But again, it was one I, when, the first time I saw it, I was like, yeah, I'm, Let's, let, I want to be part of this deal, part of this team on that one. And, um, so that one was less from the ground up than something like The Killers, where it was from its inception. Correct, correct. Gotcha. So when you are doing something where you really start from that first seed, how long does it take to go from, we've identified the artists, they have some good songs, to, all right, we're pitching this now to the, the first labels? How long does that take? And how many steps go into that process? This band that uh, we discussed are almost Monday. That's a band that I just we just we're just getting signed right now. That was I first heard them. They sent me a song online probably three and a half four years ago. Mm. They were probably fifteen sixteen at the time. Wow! And you know they they sent me a link to a few songs. There was one that I went the the lead singer's voice, especially in this one song. I went. There's there's something here. So my wife and I got in the car and went down to San Diego, went to a little a show that they were putting out, out on the putting on out on the beach at a you know a small little venue. It was just them um, and probably 150 kids. And 
watch the show. And I, again, I, I didn't think musically they were where they needed to be, but Dawson's voice, the, the singer, was just, he just has something that's unique. You know, I could really hear it that early on, that there was something just really unique. And there were a couple songs that were like, okay, this is heading in the right direction. So we, you know, I had a talk with them after the show and, you know, I, I, I tried to be really honest about here's what I like and here's what I don't like. And they were very good at taking input, listening to what I said and making that, but not trying to become something that, that, that I'm trying to make them, but taking my input and using what they like, you know, from what I said and, and trying to put that into their songs. And we did that for probably you know, several songs over the period of a few years. They're up now, you know, they were, last year they were up there like 19 years old at that point. I had met a young writer, producer at a killer show actually up in Bit Bottle Rock. Um, he came up to me backstage and started talking to me and we were talking about music, really liked the kid, says Kid, kid Simon Oshkroth. We, you know, we became great friends there. We talked through the whole killer show. I don't think we listened to a song. Um, and I flew him down to L.A. the next week and really just listened to a lot of his music. And I was, I, you know, I had a feeling that he would be great to partner up with these kids on the, right, on the writing side. And put them, I put them together in the room for the first writing session. And the first song was, you know, I described to Simon, here's where I kind of, here's my vision for this thing. And we got in the room and the first song was like, Holy crap, this is so good. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took the band probably three or four songs in before, because this, this is pretty pop sounding, this band. And uh, but just playing them, here's, I'd say we did three or four songs, some that went a little more alt rock and, you know, some that were a little more Tame and Paula or something. But, but, to, but then be able to, pl to play the band those and say, which, which one of these does your voice sound best in? You know, mm. listen to the three of them. It's like, oh, well, the one that really has this pop sense. I mean, everybody in the band has, you know, it was so obvious. Everybody in the band, every, you know, everybody fell right in the line. It's like, oh, my God, this 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 kind of production and arrangement just makes Dawson sound like a star, you know? So mm -hmm. it was it was kind of leading them to that point. And it, we thought it would probably take another year to get to get the band signed up. The first song that we put up online, it, it, not huge numbers, but probably in a couple of weeks we went to about three hundred thousand. Maybe three weeks we went to three hundred thousand spins on it on Spotify. But a lot of playlists. We had about fifty nine hundred playlists mm. and small playlists. You know, people are saving it and putting it on their personal playlists. And we ended up getting a call from Disney and and Hollywood Records and. I mean, they just love the band over there so much. They're so excited about it that we're, you know, we got it done faster than I thought. I thought it would be a more like a year campaign, you know, getting them out there playing because their numbers were not that great online yet. They just played San Diego. That's interesting. So there's more to selling a band, obviously, than just making a great sounding recording. There's there's so much more that goes into it. Like you said, the labels want to see that they can kind of develop a following. And you also mentioned the word team at some point along uh, this process. Is developing a band a, a team effort? And if so, what are the roles that have to be fulfilled, that, that have to be part of that team to, to get a band from nothing to really having a shot at, at getting a wide audience? Well, I, you know, I have... I have several people that I work with. I have my manager, Andrew Brightman. My wife, Pauline, helps with a lot of the social media stuff. You know, a a a Andrew really helps with all the, you know, on artistic decisions. He's really, uh, Andrew really, can, uh, when he hears a tune, he knows it, what he's, uh, you know, he can't get in and actually maybe t t tell me what chords to be played, but he has a great ear who I, I really trust his ear as well. If I think a song's great, I play it for Andrew and he goes, crap that's a hit you know mm -hmm. so i you know i like having him to bounce stuff off on uh to bounce stuff off of um andrew also has a lot of label relationships mm -hmm. and is pretty current on all uh, you know every you know everybody in the industry so it's good to have those kind of things to actually be able to, to you know to, to to get into an office and get your stuff played and have people actually trust you you know you need to be able to build up 
numbers either at, at clubs and online. Uh, 80, what, 80, 85 percent of the decisions made by most labels are going to be are going to be just looking at numbers online. Right. What do you think are good targets for other producers or engineers or artists trying to get to that level where you know people might be interested in backing them at that label level? What kind of numbers do you think uh, folks are looking for before they really start taking something seriously or getting really excited? I mean, they want to see. I mean, you, you know, you want to see hundreds of thousands, if not a, you know millions of streams on say Spotify. You want to you want to be able to look at those numbers and and actually. When you get into the details on that, you know how much of that is just because you got on one great playlist, or is it because people are listening to this and saving it? You know, if a band's not really touring yet, but they're playing, say, regionally in one area, what are their numbers? You know, well, you go to the shows. You know, well, what do their numbers look like at the shows? Uh, so, I mean, all that's important to me. I don't base as much of my decision off of that as I do off. One of the, you know, for me, I base most of my decision off of the lyrics, the melody, and the right. lead singer's believability you're, and delivering that. You're so. trying to get them before they get those numbers, help them hopefully that's, get those kinds of numbers. Correct. Because you've developed them into something that's really intriguing to people. And then those people who get excited about the numbers can get excited about the numbers. But it, it comes down to first you getting excited about the authenticity of it. And this is one of the interesting things to me. I really liked the story you told about coaching the guy from Almost Monday, where it almost sounds like, if I'm reading you correctly, you're almost trying to figure out how can we make him be like more of himself rather than figuring out, oh, here are all these little different yeah. versions of myself I could be, helping him find, you no, know, what's most uniquely you and different about you and how can we kind of maximize that rather than allowing you to be scattered and all these different people you could be. Let, let, let's find who you really are and bring that out. And that's what it sounded a little bit like to me. That, I mean, that's it. You know, I mean, people look at themselves in the mirror and they might describe themselves differently than 50 people looking at them, you know, would describe them a certain way. And them, they, them looking at themselves in the mirror might be a totally different description. But I mean, it's, I, again, I'm not trying to I mean, it's, I know some people who are very successful at just putting putting a band together and with their vision, their songs, you know. And that, but that's not what I do. But I you're not to, making the monkeys. You're not doing the Backstreet Boys. There is. Uh, I'm glad the monkeys existed. I definitely listened to the monkeys when I was a, a, a kid. But that's not yeah, your that's yeah. not your thing. That, that that's not what I'm trying to yeah. do. I mean, I try to find a band, and hopefully, I can see by listening to their songs. Hopefully, come up, you know, in my head. Here's here's who I think they. They really are. They're, they have. They, they already have this. It's it's already there. But I'm just trying to uncover some of the layers and let them see it. You know. Yeah. So if I can help be a guide to that point, so they can see what makes them sound better. Wonderful stuff. So a couple quick things for you from the artist perspective. If you were an artist and you were out there trying to meet up with a guy like Mark Needham, what would you do? What do you recommend to artists? A, how to find someone like you who is going to, you know, help shepherd them through this early part of their career. And two, are there any things that they should be aware of when it comes to the financials or the back end or things to be worried about or concerned for or, or to look at seriously? So I guess that's a two-parter. How to find someone like you and then what are some of the things that they should be concerned about when they're creating deals? I mean, I would try if I was a band in whatever in phoenix uh, you know i would try to find local pro you know but local producers who are p people who you respect what they do and just try to you know try to reach out to them they've done some bands that you like but maybe hope maybe it's some people who are local that you can work with reach out to them to see if they'll respond if they like what you're doing you'll probably get a lot of rejections mm -hmm. but if i was a band member i would i would be looking for somebody who doesn't want to recreate me into something I'm not, but that has, that isn't afraid to, you know, there's someone you can work with, they can voice ideas that maybe are different than what you had, but you can learn to work together and, and use the best parts of what you're seeing and what somebody's saying. You might not like everything, but finding that right person is probably not that easy, mm -hmm. you know, there are, but there are, there are a lot more people doing artist development now than when I started. So there are a lot, there's certainly a lot more people out there to choose from. 
I mean, I know so many produ yeah, pr producers who are doing artist development. You know, legally, you know, and financially, watch what you're signing. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, make make sure it's clear from as much of this as you can get clear from the beginning. You come in, say there's three band guys come in to write with a songwriter, producer. Make sure that there's some clarity on what the publishing splits are going to be. Is this everybody in the room splitting? Is it is he, is he taking fifty percent? You know, I, yeah, I mean, you just want all these things clear because I, I see so many things blow up down the line over over issues that people didn't make clear originally. Um, the deals are so all over the map. I mean, I see so many different deals. Andrew and I have a have a try to have a pretty fair deal that's that's not really jumping into a lot of the bands. You know, three. We're not doing three sixties right now. They're, I mean, the labels are already doing that. But right. I mean, the band the band has to eat on the road. If everybody's taking a piece of everything, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tricky balancing act because on the one hand, you want to leave enough so that there are other people who are going to invest in your career, and you want to give people enough so that they are invested in you. They want to see you succeed. They can put in the time, but you don't want to leave. Uh, put so much on everyone else's plate that you can't eat, like you said. Right. So, so what? Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I have to, I have to make enough money when one's very successful to be able to keep doing it. Yeah. But I'm not trying to look, to look, I'm not looking to retire on that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and taking a piece of their, of their life forever, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, and I want to leave enough money that there's, you know, you have to leave enough money so that the band can really be out on the road for as long as it takes. You know, it's, it's I mean, just getting a, a bit, big, a bunch of money up front and leaving the band nothing for promotion or being able to tour makes absolutely no sense because, you know, that's looking at the short term money rather than the long term rewards of it, you know? I mean, ideally, the the long-term rewards are much more important because that's when the band was incredibly successful. And, you know, and, but if, you know, people who take too much of a percentage of, of deals and 360, say, you know, sometimes you can leave a band where they just, they, they can't stay out on the road. They're, you know, and if they're not staying out on the road and playing shows, they're never going to be a huge band. And I mean, to, to me, be what they, what you originally wanted, which is a, a worldwide Band that that's an influence on the industry for the next ten or fifteen years, right? You know, so. so, for those people who aren't familiar with the term, a three hundred and sixty deal would basically be a piece of everything, right? Ticket sales, merch sales, record sales, the the songwriting, everything, and those seem to be happening more and more on the label end. You're saying you're not doing that on the artist development side. What are the most lucrative parts of a deal for the producer? Is it uh, getting songwriting credits? Is it points on a record? Is there anything that has to do with with touring or merch revenue? What are the tend to be the the best streams of well, income for a producer? I mean, the the best stream of income is is the live end, you know, but. Mm. Because unless you have a band that's really big, the, the money from points is negligible until you're actually selling, you know, you're selling millions of records. Right. But my goal is to shoot for things that sells millions of records so that maybe a piece of, so then the points, a piece of the deal and and maybe some percentage on of, say, uh, a five or six album deal if you have a percentage of the first album or something. Uh, you know th that that will you know I'll make more than enough money if something's you know something does twenty million singles and you know five or six million in sales right. and the band's still able to make enough money on the road that at the end of a big album it's like oh we're all like we're we're su we're like super successful now you know <laughs> we're, we're what what my what my mom and dad never thought we could be we're millionaires you know right. you know everybody has their own approach and there's so many there's not really any standard approach to the deals and Andrew and I kind of modify them we modify our deals depending on you know how much work we think we're in, we're involved in if it's something I'm just that I'm from the ground up from the ground up then it's a bigger piece if it's something I'm coming in, you know, at mixing stage, the band's already recorded stuff. You know, if I could just be part of that production mixing process, then that's a little less work for me. So 
we try to tailor our deals to fit just how much time is involved. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you're saying that for the artists that you've seen really kind of make a successful career for themselves, that they are artists who are really focused on the roadshow, on the live component seems to be where artists do the best. Do you think that a lot of new artists don't have that peace in their mind, understanding that really where the money is at is going to be on the road for them. And to a degree, the record is a calling card where if it does really, really well, they'll make money off of it. But ideally, it's a calling card to promote a bigger live show where they can really make money. Do you think that's the way artists should be thinking about it? Well, I mean, I think that's the reality right now. I mean, there's certainly a lot of other rev- revenue streams from from sinks. And, you know, I mean... When when I first started, it, it it wasn't cool for a band to to be in an advertisement. You know, right. I mean, it's yeah. like that was people wouldn't even imagine doing that. But uh, you know, I mean, it's become such a bigger part of of distribution of different you know different all the branding and stuff like that. So there's certainly a lot of money to be made off that for a band. But I mean, the live show for I mean almost all the big bands. I know that's where you know that's where their real money's at. But yeah. It's amazing how things change over time. When I was a kid, TV wasn't cool and movies were cool. And then, you know, in more recent years with, you know, Netflix and HBO and all that stuff, TV is cool and movies are relatively uncool. And uh, when you were getting started in the the 70s, I think you were doing your first records in in the 70s, right? When you were getting started, my guess is that the... uh, there None was of sometimes that was cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And probably also a lot of money was made on records and to a degree people could lose money on tour as long as they got to sell a bunch of records. So things have yeah, I mean, reversed a little bit. It, it, it's totally flipped. I mean, the it used to, the money used to be made off the records and the tours were basically just were to support the album sales. Right. So I mean the tours were kind of a, a loss leader to support album sales. I had I remember what Mo Austin once said that he gauged, gauged a hit record by how many tons shipped out the door, you know? <laughs> um, so he gauged, gauged it in weight. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, yeah, it's definitely, it, it's definitely flipped where the, the, the tour, the live touring is the majority of the income for most bands now. Yeah. Now, when they get to when they get to a big enough stage, you know. Right. Now you say you don't do three sixty deals, but do you often try to find a way so that you're involved on the live end of things? If that's really going to be a big part of it, do some of your deals involve the, the live side? And if so, what are the ranges on on something like that? We haven't been doing that lately. You know, I guess it'll depend. On, it would depend on the situation. If it's if it was something we're putting together from scratch, you know, and we're shepherding through that whole process and we might take a percentage of the live side, but the contracts just get so much more complicated. But Andrew and I try to keep this as simple as possible. You know, uh, I really can't get the specifics of on course. our deals, you know, yeah. but, but, you know, we just try to keep it, we try to keep it really simple. And, you know, if we can fit it on a page, great, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and not get into, the 80 page deals. I mean, I've done those in the past, but you know, Andrew's really been great at just taking this back to something super simple. You know, here, the bank, yeah, I can actually understand that. Oh my God, you know? <laughs> so I, that, that, that's kind of where we've gone right now, you know? Uh, I, you know, but again, everybody has their own approach to doing that. It's a, it's a judgment call that a band has to make what they're, what they're going to give up in order to you know, to, to get the assistance of somebody who's, put, who's putting in a lot of time and energy, you know, yeah. uh, if, they're, if they're finding a producer who's going to work with them for free, that guy said that, that, you know, that person's taking a really big risk mm-hmm. on them with their time and their money. So, so they need to be compensated. I think, you know, it's just that the band and the producer can come up with something that's fair. You know, yeah. it's, it's tough. Right. Two of the things I think that every uh, that people who haven't done a lot of negotiating don't realize, and this would be something I think any everyone who's doing negotiations for the first time can get through their head. One, it's about finding ways for everybody to win. 
I mean, that's the idea. When you're negotiating, it's like, <laughs> how do we find a way so that you're happy, I'm happy, he's happy, she's happy? That's the goal of negotiation. So that's something that sometimes you know, people get scared of that word, but that's all it is. It's like, how can we all win? How can we make it so that you'll work with me and you're happy and I'm still happy? So that's one thing. The other big thing about uh, negotiation that I think a lot of people don't realize is, like you said, every deal is different because literally Everything can be negotiated with the exception of those few things where they're like laws, <laughs> where there's a statute saying you right. have to negotiate this into the deal. But other than that, man, it could be anything. You could give up as much or as little of whatever a- any piece makes sense. So people can really be creative. Now, that said, it's probably a good idea to talk to other bands, talk to managers, figure out, uh, you know, not off of a podcast, but get, you know, help from someone who's done these deals and really, you know, talk through what they could look like. And, and hopefully you find people you trust that you can have these conversations with because it's ever evolving. I'm sure deals look different now than they did for you 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago. Uh, and, and yeah, there's no set rules, but I mean, I think, I think what you said is so important that if people forget in negotiations is that, Let's just find a way that everybody can win, you know, and, and let's just make let's make sure that if this is successful, everybody does well and feels happy, you know, it lifts everybody. Um, I think that gets lost a lot in negotiations and stuff gets contentious and, you know, well, you did. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it, you know, I think people lose sight of let's all just try to do really well and have a hit record because none of this is worth anything. You know, I mean, you're just talking about, you know, you're, you're, it's a, it's a mon- it's monopoly money until you have a hit, hit record. It means nothing, you know? Good point. Yeah, very good point. Well, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about the tech end. You've been with us for almost an hour now. I don't want to keep you all day. You've been really generous with your time. But I do want to ask you a little bit about the kind of more, more techy end. So first off, are you mixing the majority of records that you produce or have you ever found it useful to hand things off to a mixer? I... I have handed things off that I'm producing to other mixers. Uh, you know, I've I've done that a few a few times. Uh, generally, I mix mix what I produce, but it's it's a little harder. It's a kind of a different mindset. I have to you have to kind of dis to try to disassociate yourself from as a mixer for something I've been producing. It's you know it's so easy. You've been producing it. You hear it this way, and that's the way it should be. And not necessarily. That's why I would, I mean, that's why people come to me because I can go like listen to what they've done and go, well, that, that's good. That's good. But, you know, we could do this. It's going to, you know, on these sections, it's going to sound so much better. And, um, so if I can, as long as I feel I'm keeping that, I could disassociate myself and really come in and, you know, be able to get away from, uh, you know, the ideas that I've had that maybe I didn't need to be locked into. But I'm certainly not adverse to having other people mixed up if I'm producing. Right. Now, when it comes to the the production side, when you are in the process of producing the record, are you more the Rick Rubin type who is stepping back and coming in every once in a while to help make important decisions? Or do you like to be there kind of engineering on the projects kind of day in, day out? What's your rhythm like on that stuff? Yeah, I'm usually pretty involved from from the get go. Um, I mean, I like to, to be there too, you know, I like to spend a lot of time in pre-production, really trying out every idea that we can, just get get as many things set so that before you actually start tracking the record that, you know, a lot of decisions have been made and you're not, if you can have it, so you act, if you're, say, actually in the studio recording, if, if you can free yourself of those kind of things that people can argue over or get caught up in details and hours hashing over a part, I mean that's still going to happen anyhow. Right. But if you can, but if you can, uh, you know, if you can, if you can have some of that out of the way, so people can just be relaxed and be creative. I mean that's one thing Rick, Rick was uh, was always very good at is actually just setting the stage so that people can just come in and be relaxed and be creative. You know, it's one thing that that he was that he's great at. If I'm producing, I usually like to be more involved. I'm not. I don't like to get so involved that I know some producers who. It's really their way or the highway, and I, I, I'm not that kind of guy. I usually like to try to find, see if I can get the parts out of people or without saying, you know, you have to spe- specifically play this note, this note, this note, kind of, you know. So, I, I, you know, I like, to, I like to be involved, but not actually, I'm not trying to start my own band, I guess. <laughs> right. <I hear laughs> you. you know? Yeah. <laughs> 
Gotcha. And then, uh, so it almost sounds to a degree like if you can, the actual recording of it should be a little bit more executing the ideas you came up in pre-production rather than the time that you're experimenting. <laughs> like you said, obviously yeah. one <laughs> crosses over into the other, but you're trying to yeah. make some of the big decisions in pre-production, it sounds like, at least as right. many as you can. So can you tell us a little bit about the pre-production process looks like? I think it is one of the most overlooked parts of the process by people who are new at this. And I think it's one of the parts of the process that's most appreciated by people who've been doing it a long time. So how do you usually like to handle pre-production? Is it about getting in the room with the band live? Is it about doing quick and dirty demo recordings of songs? How do you like to do that? I mean, and that depends on the band and the song. You know, every song is different and every band is different. But having tempos worked out, having... You know, don't don't get in the in the studio and realize that the singer can't sing it in this key. Really look at the arrangements. Really try to cut the fat out of the arrangements. Um, and are you doing like uh, quick and dirty multi track recordings to help establish that stuff, or is it more just kind of yeah, on the fly? Like yeah, that? yeah, I've always and and nothing's a demo mm -hmm. in my you know in my world anyhow. Every everything that you record is possibly going to be on the record, including your pre-production demo you know mm. that might that might that might end up being the record so i don't have, you know i don't do things too quick and dirty mm -hmm. but you know i i mean i i'm really really quick at getting sounds at this point so I, it's not that's not something i worry about that oh oh crap that's going to be on the record it sounds horrible you know yeah um but you know I, I, every performance is to me it's possibly going to end up on the record Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. And now I have to ask you a little bit about the gear side as a man who is once a self-confessed gear whore. I, see <laughs> I, a, <laughs> I still have a geek. <laughs> I see a beautiful, it looks like a Neumann mic uh, over to your right there. Is that what it is? Is it an 87? Uh, it's hard to no, tell. No, that's, that's actually a Sanken CU-47. Oh. That's, actually, that's actually the mic I use for Wicked Game. Nice. Wow. All right. No That's wonder true. you sound so lovely on this podcast. <laughs> I can hear the reverb right now. No, the reverb doesn't come built into the mic, does it? Anyway, what are some of the other, in addition to this beautiful microphone, what are some of the other pieces that you have in your studio that you're glad that you have and you find yourself using a lot and you'd be sad if they went away? I mean, I have a lot. Of, I have rack of, rack of Neve 1081s, which are my favorite Neve pre's and a lot of, uh, uh, the Jeff Day King pre's, I use those a lot. Mm -hmm. George Matt, a couple of George Mazenberg preamps that I use. Um, you know, I have a, some of my old, old compressors that I kept. I, a lot of my outboard gear I, I've gotten rid of because I do so much in the box, but mm -hmm. I have some EA, old EAR compressors mm -hmm. and some, some old UA stuff, Universal Audio, the UAD stuff in the box. I'm just, I, you know, I've, I've been working with UAD for a long time and the stuff is so great. I mean, I've and most of my artists and producers I work with are using that, so we can transfer stuff back and forth and and have I you know be able to maintain those ideas without me looking for like what are the what are what they were using on this? But um, so you know, I, I, and I have so I, again, I've started going in the box. Right after I finished the Hot Fuss record, I started going like kind of partial in the halfway in the box. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really early in on that. Probably around by 2010, 11, something like that, I started going fully in the box now. And I have pretty much every plug in it. And I buy new stuff all the time because yeah. something shows up. And it's like, what's this plug in? And why, you know, people, I tell, you know, people will send stuff with their effects on it. It's like, oh, God, I got to get that one too, you know? Mm -hmm. I, get, I always get, I always get the, these little emails coming in. What did you buy this time? Well, you know, um, I'm, because I, I, you know, I'm buying new plugins every day as <laughs> stuff comes in. It's, it's fun, you know, and there's, there's so many, there's so many great things out there to work with, but, yeah, I would say you. Yeah, the UAD stuff is really my kind of go-to. Nice. Now, could you give us a tour of what this mostly digital room looks like? Is it possible to pick up the camera and give us a little swivel? Are you in a, a state of repair where this would be acceptable? Sure, it's kind of a little bit of a mess right now. Here, let me pick up the camera. Don't worry, there's only a few thousand people watching. Yeah. Sorry if over here. I, you, know, you can see I have a. There's, there's my back wall, which is kind of the same as yours. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, there'll be a lot of guitars and stuff around here. 
Yeah. Um, there's some some leopards down there, mm-hmm. or guitars. And I love how many instruments there are in here, yeah. There are a lot of instruments in here, and I'm kind of set up in the middle here right now. Here, let me turn this light off, which is shining. I had turned on. Um, so I have some racks of pre's and keyboards, a kipper over here. Um, so I've just been in the middle of trying to trying to record a project, so I've kind of just shoved some keyboards and guitars out of the way. Mm-hmm. And so, I have an old I have an old pump organ there in the back. You so I imagine you you're that. pretty musical yourself. I mean, making arrangement decisions with people. Uh, you get some songwriting credits uh, here and there on records too, right? So yeah, sometimes. I mean, I I I don't play as much as I should. I still play on stuff, but you know, I don't I. There's only so much time in the day, and I spend so much time in here. It's I need to sit down and play my guitars more now. I pick up, I'm like, oh god, I gotta start playing more. <laughs> just, but with the, the wonders of Pro Tools, I can sound like a genius, you know. There you go. Um, but you know, I know so many. I, I, I mean, I know so many great players here in Los Angeles mm-hmm. that live within five blocks of me, you know. Uh, Matt Chamberlain lives down the street. Who's you know one of the best drummers I know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I just have all these these people. I have all these resources around. Which, um, but you know, just c- c- coming from originally being a guitar player, a drummer, it it makes it so much easier to have conversations with studio musicians if I'm working with or with bands about parts. You know, it's it's I, I have. I, you know, I have a lot of engineers that I've helped train, and it's always, it's always tough if they don't play anything. Right. You know, it's it's just so hard to have that, have that discussion with them if they're not if they don't actually play an instrument. Yeah. If the only thing you play is the DAW, you know, even editing must be so much slower for people who don't have that kind of musical background. Uh, it's it's so difficult sometimes with it. Like I, I listen to doing edit, editing stuff. It's like, oh my god! <laughs> no, I'm the one, what? the one. Do you know what the one is? <laughs> yeah, I've been there. We've yeah, all did, been there. Why? Why did you make that choice? <laughs> um, why is there a bar of five in in this Chris? I, I had I had an editor. It was a TV editor that had edited a Chris Isaac track that they sent back. They were trying to make fit into some into some scene but they literally had changed it into like the whole song to five four. Oh, the mirror shit <laughs> yeah. I, just, yeah, that's I mean that's I mean you know i mean chris could play the song of five four but he usually that's that's not really where he goes you know yeah. it's that's yeah that's gonna change the mood for sure absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Ah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for taking uh, so much time out of your busy day. I really appreciate it. I love this room that you're in, too. I love these ceilings I'm looking at. It's interesting. Like It's not like totally uh, uh, acoustically treated out. Like It really feels like a lived-in space, you know? That, and that's, there's decor. that's kind of the idea, you know? Yeah. But you do most of your mixing in that room, and you've gotten to know it to the point where you can really make some good sounds in there, yeah? I, I mean, these ceilings actually. I I had a yeah. I had a room uh, for about ten years before I built this room that had these same types of ceilings. Where it's, I mean, but the ceiling is really designed to be a big diffuser. Right. That looks like it looks like a, you know, a really ornate mm-hmm. cherry wood ceiling. But it's 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 really designed to work. As Can a we take diffuser, another quick so. peek at it? Yeah. There we go. Now? Oh yeah. Absolutely. So I get how it'd be. Yeah. Uh, so so th- those thing. octagons are actually the inside comes down. So those are all angled, you know. It's so and they're all diff- different sides octagons. Every, you know, it's all meant to be. It's meant to work as a diffuser, but but still look like feel like a living room inside. You know. Yeah, no, I, I love the vibe, and it definitely makes sense with your personality. I, I dig the whole thing. Well, uh, I'm going to give a big shout out before I give you your last thanks. A big thanks to our sponsors who we are able to make this thing for free because of them. Since you own a lot of plugins, I'm going to guess you own some plugins by these guys. Sound Toys. Do you own any Sound Toys plugins? I I, I know the Sound Toys guys. <laughs> I have all their stuff. I know the Sonar Works guy. You know, yeah, I guess I know all yeah. those guys. I love oh, do you them. use yeah. Sonar Works at all in your studio? I do use Sonar Works. I just because we go, you know, especially I have two different rooms, and sometimes I'm tracking over other rooms. I always love to just go if I have a room I'm just tracking in. If I could shoot the room really quick, it's 
it's so great. You know, it just it comes. I come back to my studio, and it's like, oh, it's like, oh my god, what is this sound? You know, so it's nice to have just every room I work in can I can quickly make, you know, to sound reasonably in the vicinity. You know, really great. I didn't even think of that. You know, uh, that idea of oh my goodness, most people who are really doing record production are traveling around or getting into new environments, and like you said, being able to shoot that out and get a sense. Of you know, so there's no surprises when you get back home. I like that idea. I hadn't thought of it, so thank you for bringing that up. So big shout out to Sound Toys for sponsoring. Thank you guys. Check them out. SoundToys.com. Try out anything they make for free. Sonar Works. I think you can actually demo their stuff for free too. Where you buy the whole package with a little measurement microphone. I think it takes like ten minutes to shoot out a room and uh, get it a lot flatter. And also Gear Club. If you are hungry for more talk about this kind of stuff, head on over to Gear Club. Type in Gear Club to wherever you get your podcast, or check them out at Gear-Club.net. Mr. Mark Needham. Thank you so much for being part of the Sonic Scoop podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great. All right. I'm going to go listen to some Killers now, listen to some Chris Isaac now, and maybe I'll listen to some Imagine Dragons. I didn't even realize that you uh, were uh, helping develop those guys uh, starting in at the mixing stage and really helping them form their sound. So thank you so much for the time, and uh, thank you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time.